have responded to the need of this archdiocese and this community every day since. Providence Care seeks to continue the pioneering vision of the Sisters of Providence by providing care for the whole person, body, and spirit. Every effort is made to ensure that the respect and dignity and compassion to which we're called are experienced by everyone entrusted to their care. Inspiring the physical care, which they have consistently provided so very well, is a keen awareness that the care of the soul, the care of the spirit, is integral to the care of the body. Always remembered is the belief that there lives within each of us something of God. And that spirit gives to every single person an infinite dignity and infinite worth. That truth, the sisters and Providence Care have never forgotten. For 150 years, you have shown this community what health care at its finest can be. This Archdiocese has been blessed by your presence, by your example, and by your mission. May you continue to lead as you have always led. As it happens, the Archbishop, Archbishop O'Brien, is at a gathering in Rome this week at a meeting on the role of the Church in health care. He was delighted to receive the invitation to be here and regretted that he could not be present. But if he were here, I know he would congratulate you, assure you of the continuing support of the Archdiocese, and remind us that the Lord is speaking to all of us when he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. And Providence answers. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be among you as Providence Care celebrates 150 years of health care ministry. Thank you for honoring our sisters, your founders. If I used my imagination, I could look out and see seated among you thousands of men, women, and children whose lives have been touched by those who, over these 150 years, have ministered at Providence Manor, originally the House of Providence, St. Mary's of the Lake, which began as an orphanage, and more recently, mental health services. I see patients, residents, clients, seated among the sisters, the staff, and volunteers and friends who are here. The sisters may have initiated this ministry, but they have always relied upon others to help them to realize their ministry. We, the Sisters of Providence of St. Vincent de Paul, have had a long history connected to the healing ministry of Jesus. Let me try to take you back to the beginning. On December the 13th, 1861, four Sisters of Providence of Montreal arrived in Kingston on the invitation of Bishop E.J. Horan. Their mission 
was to care for the elderly, sick, poor, orphans, and women prisoners. The building they came to in 1861 still stands as the sisters' residence here at Providence Manor. It is difficult for us to even try to imagine what the first sisters went through. Put on your imagination. 1861, think of the sights that they may have seen. The poor on the streets, smell the smells they may have smelled. Cleanliness was hard to come by back then. Think of the noise, people milling around in the streets, horses, wagons. Hard to imagine. Perhaps a few stories can paint a picture. The founding sisters arrived after an eight hour arduous train ride from Montreal on December the 13th, 1861, at two o'clock in the morning, cold and hungry. Two sisters were of French origin and two were of Irish descent. In two weeks' time, they had 10 orphans. In one week, they had made 40 visits to the sick in their homes, very early home care services. They had also visited women inmates in the prisons. In a year's time, the doors were opened to the sick and the frail. The hardest part of their ministry was survival for themselves and for the sick, poor, and orphans, literally. They received no remuneration for their work and received no government help to pay for food, utilities, or basic necessities. However, Providence provided, through local merchants, professional people, benefactors, and volunteers who gave what they could. By far, the most difficult means of support came from the sisters going on begging tours. They would go out, two sisters together, in late autumn or winter, to the rural areas. The men of the area would drive the sisters with horse and wagon or sleigh to farms where people might have provisions to spare to donate to the House of Providence. The sisters suffered physically from cold and rough, bumpy roads, exposed to wind and rain, and occasionally being tossed out into snowdrifts. They suffered emotionally as well as they received many rebuffs, ridicule, and humiliation. But Providence, through the generosity, often of the poor, giving to the poor, provided again and again. After one such tour of four weeks, the two sisters returned with $260 3,000 pounds of meat, there was no refrigeration, 100 bushels of wheat, and a supply of flour and yarn. That was a great catch. Even with the help of others, the sisters worked untiringly. In fact, at the end of the first two years, I'm sorry, at the end of the first year, two of the original four sisters became seriously ill. Sister Mary of Mount Carmel died. She was 30 years old and only seven years in religion. In contrast 
to the many hardships, there were also many blessings. And God was in the blessings too. Those whom they served, the poor, the sick, the orphans, and the people in prisons, actually anyone who came to them, they were all seen as blessings. The goodness of the laity of Kingston and the support of the clergy encouraged them. On March the 25th, 1862, the first candidates to religious life were received at the House of Providence. Two Kingstonians, Catherine McKinley and Anne O'Reilly. This gave the sisters hope as the new found religious foundation could now begin. Unlike today, the early sisters didn't worry about what is their mission? What might it be? What might it look like? They didn't do long range planning or strategic planning and visioning. They saw the unmet needs of their time and they did it. Trust in Providence over the years prevailed so that building projects took place even though money was scarce. New missions were begun, although sisters were few. Providence was there for them in the presence of good people wanting to do good things. The example of the sisters attracted Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Catherine McKinley, Mother Mary Edward, wrote after the first 10 years, the first 10th anniversary, she wrote, looking back as we did through the tangled paths of that decade of years, we could visibly trace the ever watchful hand of Providence guiding us through rough and thorny ways. So let us leave the distant past in the past for now. Let's look at the recent past. I was privileged to be on the leadership team of the Sisters of Providence of St. Vincent de Paul in the late 1990s and early 2000s. I saw firsthand how the mission of the Sisters was still alive in our healthcare institutions. The dedicated board members CEOs, Guy Legros, followed by Kathy Dunn, and the sister members of the board, made decisions based on what would enhance the lives of patients and residents of the then Providence Continuing Care Centre. All those entrusted to our care continued to benefit from the sisters' mission because the staff and volunteers made it their mission. Having been a staff member at St. Mary's of the Lake, I know that the ideal of compassionate care doesn't hang on the wall in a picture frame. It is exercised every day at the bedside of each patient. As a consumer of care, for two of our Sisters of Providence at Providence Manor, I observed the dignity they and other residents were accorded on a daily basis. These experiences reinforced my belief that the 